Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. In this video we're going to be solving all the problems from the MIT Integration B 2024 finals. Uh, I'm going to have fully written up solutions and we're also going to go into the tiebreaker and lightning round problems. Now one thing I want to say is that I actually had the privilege to uh, live stream this event this year so I was able to sort of take on the problems at the same times as the competitors which I thought was a really interesting experience and I definitely recommend it for anyone who wants to go ahead and try these problems to try and do it like side by side with the B. So let's go ahead and jump right into the solutions. So immediately from right here we can see um, we have e to the x over 2 times cosine of x over the cube root of 3 cosine of x plus 4 of x. Now, the first thing I notice here is we have a lot of functions multiplied together, so we're definitely going to be dealing with some sort of product rule. Also, if anything gets differentiated, or anything that, um, that gets differentiated and gives us this uh, cube root of 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x on the bottom is going to have to be... Um, 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x raised to the 2 thirds power because that's the only way we're going to get anything out of that. So from there I just took some uh, sort of derivatives related to this right here. So first of all, notice that d dx of 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x is 4 cosine x minus 3 sine x. And also that means if we differentiate 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x to the 2 thirds, we'll get this expression right here. And if we don't differentiate it and we just rewrite 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x raised to the 2 third power, um, in the sort of the same format here, we get a very, very similar uh, expression here. Notice we just have this 4 cosine x minus 3 sine x, and here we have 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x. If we multiply this 2 thirds in, our overall term with sine x will be minus 2 sine x, and here it will be 4 sine x. And our overall answer, we want it to be, we want to only have cosine x, not sine x, so we need these two to cancel. But luckily, because of the product rule, the derivative of e to the x over 2 is 1 half times e to the x over 2. So notice that here, if we let f equal 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x, and we let g be e to the x over 2, then overall, if we take those two functions and we get f prime g plus g prime f, this, uh, the term containing this one will be uh, f prime g, or no, g prime f, sorry. And so there will be actually be a one-half term from differentiating e to the x over 2. So we'll have a one-half multiplied by here. And so this will actually give us a 2 sine x term, which will cancel. So that means if we differentiate e to the x over 2 times 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x to the 2 thirds, it's going to give us the right answer. The only thing is we have these cosine x terms that are in front that are going to have different coefficients. And so we need to sort of figure out what uh, we're probably going to have to multiply this by a constant factor. So if we just go ahead and take the derivative directly of e to the x over 2 times 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x to the 2 thirds, we get this right here. We have 8 thirds cosine x plus 3 halves cosine x. And so if we combine terms right here, it's 25 over 6 cosine x. We want our final answer to just have cosine x times 1, so we need to just multiply this whole thing by 6 25ths. So our overall answer is 6 25ths e to the x over 2 times 3 cosine x plus 4 sine x to the 2 thirds plus c. Our second problem is very, very interesting. I understand there's a number of ways to solve this, but it definitely screams Feynman's trick, at least to me. However, we have to be really careful when we're do fi doing Feynman's trick, because if we do a really natural substitution, like this right here, putting the a, our parameter next to e to the x, or over here, replacing 1, these integrals actually won't converge for any value of a other than, um, in this case, a equals 2, and in this case, a equals 1. And since the integrals don't converge, this function is only defined at a single point, and we can't even differentiate it at all because you need more than one point, uh, more than one defined point in order to differentiate a function. The reason these won't converge is because at zero, this one over e to the x term uh, sort of diverges to infinity, and so we need to also have this uh, upper term be zero at the same time. So in order to have this natural logarithm um, be equal to zero, we need the input of the natural logarithm to be one. And so we have to be really careful when placing the parameter. So this is where I chose to place the parameter. If we put e to the x plus a times e to the x minus 1, this term will always be equal to 0, and this term will always be equal to 1. So that'll give us our 0 in the numerator, which will cancel with a 0 in the denominator. Also, when we differentiate, this e to the x minus 1 cancels on the bottom. We get this right here. And then all we have to do is go ahead and solve this integral, which is really straightforward. Um, it's just going to be power series from here on out, so we'll divide by uh, a plus 1. We'll take that out, and we'll let this b equal a over a plus 1. Then we'll go ahead and multiply by e to the negative x on the top and bottom, and then expand this out as a power series. Very, very typical integration right here. 
and we're going to get this series 1 over a plus 1 times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of b to the n over n plus 1. You might notice this as negative 1 over b, natural log over 1 minus b. So we go ahead and plug that in right here. We substitute it in our definition of b, and actually we get that i prime equals 1 over a times natural log of 1 plus a dA. Then we integrate this from 0 to 1. Now integrating it from 0 to 1, we actually expand this natural logarithm as a power series again. And this will just evaluate to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n over n plus 1 squared. This is just eta of 2. And eta of 2 is equal to um, 1 half zeta of 2, which is pi squared over 12. Um, and this i of 1 gives us our original integral, because when a equals 1, we get our original integral. And when a equals 0, we get natural log of e to the x over e to the x minus 1. So this is just the integral from 0 to infinity of x over e to the x minus 1 dx. And this is just a form of the Bose integral. Uh, if you don't know how to solve this integral, just expand, uh, multiply by e to the negative x and expand everything out as a power series and then use the gamma function. But um, this is a pretty common formula, so I think integration uh, b participants should probably know that this is pi squared over 6. And if we add pi squared over 6 and pi squared over 12, we get the answer, which is pi squared over 4. Problem number three uh, here was a little bit interesting. There's a few different ways to take a look at this, but I think this method is definitely the fastest and the easiest. So these are two formulas that I use all the time in integration. Of course, I do memorize them, but um, the only reason I'm able to remember them is because I remember the derivation that leads up to them. So the first one is probably more common. It's the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 over 1 plus x to the n dx. Definitely an essential for any sort of... Uh, integration b. Um, and this is equal to pi over n cosecant pi s over n. And another less, much less common one, but also very interesting one, is the princ Cauchy principal value of the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 over 1 minus x to the n dx equals pi over n times cotangent of pi s over n. Pretty much the same formula, just with cotangent. And so using these two formulas, we can express the solution in terms of um, cosecants and cots. So pretty so again, I highly recommend memorizing these formulas if you plan to go in, in, into an in integration B because these formulas are super easy to use and they show up all the time. So in order to actually apply these formulas, we multiply by 1 minus x on the top and bottom. And then we're going to split this integral from negative infinity to 0 and 0 to infinity. And then we sort of flip the integral from negative infinity to 0 to be an integral from 0 to infinity. And this gives us these two integrals right here. We can split up this first integral into Cauchy principal values. And then the second integral just splits up normally. And then we just go ahead and apply the formulas, and we get this pi over 5 times cotangent pi over 5 minus cotangent 2 pi over 5 plus cosecant pi over 5 plus cosecant 2 pi over 5. Now, this is the actual answer that was written in the B, and these answers are absolutely equivalent to each other. You can go ahead and check with all the nasty sine pi over 5 and cosine pi over 5, though I honestly wouldn't recommend it. In my opinion, they should really also accept the above answer, which I believe they probably would. They just say that nothing has to be in a super unsimplified form. So problem number four is probably one of my favorites. This is my favorite type of problem that shows up in integration bees, and this just uh, is the kind of problem where it's pretty obvious you just have to use cubic roots and the uh, Cardano's formula. So you don't actually technically have to use the cubic formula. You could do some fancy math, but I prefer to use the cubic formula because it just looks so cool. So if we have a cubic equation, y cubed plus py plus q equals zero, then we know that the, solu one, the real solution for y will be this expression right here. Uh, there should be a cube root right here that I believe I missed. So I'll just go ahead and add that in right now. And notice that this matches up exactly with the integrand right here. So if we let y equal the integrand, we find that our q value, which is just going to be this number right here, is going to be negative 2. And our p value, which is matches up with this right here, is going to be negative 3x. So this means that if y is our integrand again, then y satisfies the equation y, y cubed minus 3xy minus 2 equals 0. And what this means is that we can go ahead and solve for x, which is super easy, and then this gives us an expression for x in terms of y. And then we can just differentiate, and we get that dx equals 2y over 3 plus 2 over, 3, 2 over 3y squared dy. Now we have to solve for the bounds, which is probably, honestly, one of the hardest parts of this. If we let x equals negative one-third, we get y cubed plus y minus 2 equals 0. And the obvious solution by inspection here is y equals 1. If we let x equals 1, 
we're going to find that y cubed minus 3y minus 2 equals 0, and the solution here is, of course, just y equals 2. So we go ahead and plug this directly in. We're integrating from 1 to 2. Remember that y was equal to the integrand, so we need that y here, and then our differential times dy. We multiply everything out, and we do some standard integration, and the final answer is 14 over 9 plus 2 thirds ln 2. And now, it's time for the big one. Now, one thing I want to say is that I'm not really great at math Olympiad type stuff. I'm more of a calculus sort of guy, so my solution here will probably not be very great. I'd honestly suggest that some of you go seek out other videos on the topic because I know that there are other methods to approach this that are probably a lot better. I'll try to explain as best as I can my method for solving this, but honestly, it's I know it's not one of the best methods. So let's go ahead and jump into the way that I solve this problem. So first of all, we got to break up a few different things in our uh, inside this integral. I'm going to let this right here equal f sub n of x. Now, the first thing to notice is that this is either equal to 0 or 1, right? Because the difference between these two are, uh, inputs of the floor function is less than 1, either they're within the same integer range or they're not within the same integer range, which gives us a result of either 0 or 1. So this means that the maximum of 1 over 2n times fn of x will be the lowest, uh, will be for, um, it'll come when we have n, when we find the lowest n such that fn of x equals 1. So, for example, if um, this function, if fn of x equals 0 for n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, but it equals 1 for n equals 4, then our n for that uh, x will be 4. So, let's look at a, uh, where fn of x equals 1 for different values of n. Now, first of all, I want to note that for n is greater than 0, fn of x is just a compression of f0 of x. It just gets shifted, um, squished to the left by a factor of 2 every time. So here, uh, I have a number line from 0 to 1, and I've, I've sort of shaded in the areas where fn of x is going to be um, 1. And everywhere else that's not shaded, fn of x is going to be 0. So we have a nice little bar of 1 fourth length for n equals 0. For n equals 1, we have two little bars of 1 eighth length, one of them starting at the center. For n equals 2, we have four bars of 1 16th length. And for n equals 3, we have these eight bars here. And I'm actually going to be calling these boxes, and you'll see why. So essentially, these show us the areas for which we can uh, determine the lowest value of n. So for example, in this region from 0 to 1 fourth, fn of x equals 1 for n equals 0. So that means our value of n is just going to be 0. However, once we leave this area, fn of x won't be 0 because um, f0 of x will just be 0 as well. So that won't help us. So for example, between this region, between 1 half and uh, I believe this is 5 eighths, uh, fn of x will be equal to 1 for n equals 1. So I've sort of circled this box here because this tells us that in this region, f1 of x will be the uh, maximum value. And I've circled all these other boxes also as well, which also represent um, places where that box is going to be the dominant box. And so notice that there's some boxes here that aren't circled, and that essentially means that there was an fn of x for a lower value of n that also was equal to 1 in this region. So that means that these boxes are not counted when we're actually calculating the integral. So. Here comes the interesting part. We have to actually figure out how many boxes are of each type of n. So for example, just from, from this graph right here, you can see that for n equals 0, there's only one box in this region 0 to 1 for n equals 0. There's also only one box for n equals 1. However, for n equals 2, there's two boxes. And for n equals 3, there's three boxes. And it turns out it only took me one more. I graphed up to n equals 4. And I was able to find that this is actually the Fibonacci sequence. So I have this in, in a table here. For n going from 0 to 4, it follows 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. So the number of boxes of each order is equal to f of n plus 1. Uh, n plus 1 just because the Fibonacci sequence starts at 1 rather than 0. And so um, there's actually reasoning for why these are the Fibonacci numbers, which I'll try to explain, though I don't think it'll be a very good explanation. But essentially, now all we have to do is we have to sum up the areas of all these boxes. Now, these boxes, first of all, we know that there's a different number of each type of box. We also know that each box has a width. 
for n equals 0, this width is 1 fourth. For n equals 1, this width is 1 eighth, and so on and so forth. It's a pretty easy formula. And we also need to integrate, uh, since we're doing an integral, we'll also need the height, which is essentially just the value of the function at that point. And notice that if we go all the way up here, we know that inside a box, this value will be 1, and then we're just multiplying by 1 over 2 to the n. So overall, this means that the actual value of our integral will be the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of f of f sub n plus 1, this is the number of boxes of order n, 1 fourth times 1 over 2 to the n, this is the width of each type of box, times 1 over 2 to the n, this is the height of the boxes. And then we just have to evaluate this summation. So why are there Fibonacci numbers here? It's kind of hard to explain. If we look at a region containing two boxes of order n, so this is just a region of a certain length right here that happens to contain two boxes of order n, there are three possibilities. Possibility one is that the box contains, a, this region contains a box of order n minus three or lower. So for example, if this box was here, then that means this entire area is blocked off and we can't have any boxes of order n because the box of order n minus 3 dominates. However, if the region contains a counted box of order n minus 2 or n minus 1, this box right here that I've circled in yellow will be counted towards the total because we know that there isn't a box of order n minus 3 or lower, and so that means that this area is completely free for this box. So that means the total boxes, total number of boxes of order n will be the number of boxes of order n minus 1 plus the number of boxes of order n minus 2 giving us the Fibonacci recursion. Now we just have to evaluate the summation. And to do this, we're going to use, I believe this is called Binet's formula, I don't know, there's a lot of different forms, but I just prefer this formula right here. f sub n equals 1 over root 5, phi to the n minus phi bar to the n. Phi bar is just the conjugate of phi, or also equal to 1 minus phi. And just evaluating the summation, we just uh, simplify everything right here. Multi do our geometric series, multiply everything out, and eventually we get the actual answer, which is 4 over 11. And I have to be honest that I really struggled with this problem, and I have no idea how both integrators solved this both in just 5 minutes, especially after missing the 4 previous questions, which in my opinion were a lot easier compared to this question. So let's go ahead and look at the tiebreaker and, and lightning round problems. Give me a moment to switch to my other whiteboard. So let's jump right into these tiebreaker problems. I really like the tiebreaker problems. I thought that a lot of them were interesting, and they also varied a lot in difficulty, which I think is good for a tiebreaker. So here's the first problem right here. Whenever you see something like this, where you have a power of x plus 1 in the, the denominator, and it's raised to some other power, you should immediately do this trick, which is where you factor x to the fourth plus 1 as x to the fourth times 1 plus x to the negative fourth, then you bring it outside. Then we just go ahead and substitute u equals 1 plus x to the negative fourth, and then du is negative 4x to the negative fifth. After some reorganization here, we can put the du on top, and then we can put everything in terms of u. Then we just let u equal v to the fourth here to get rid of this fourth root, and then we get this integral right here, negative v cubed over v to the fourth minus 1 times v. We can then do some fancy little factoring tricks right here to get this, this right here, and then all we have to do is um, integrate uh, this is going to be the integral arctangent, and this is our inverse hyperbolic cotangent. So negative one-half tan inverse of the fourth root of one plus x to the negative fourth, plus one-half inverse hyperbolic cotangent of the fourth root of one plus x to the negative fourth plus c. Note that the answer in the b was written in a different form, but this is absolutely equivalent. Here's a really fun one. The tiebreakers problem two, integral from zero to pi of sine of two x minus five sine x times sine x all over cosine two x minus ten cosine of x plus 13 dx. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to apply the double angle formulas here for the sine of 2x and cosine 2x. Then we're going to factor out a sine of x out of this term, and then we're going to rewrite sine squared of x as 1 minus cosine, cosine squared x. And this means that we have now everything in terms of cosine x, which means that we can actually do some, um, some long division and then some partial fractions and then apply the wire stress substitution to actually evaluate this integral. So I'm letting cos x equal v. Notice that I'm not calculating dv or making any substitution like this. I don't know why it says dv since this should really say dx, so I'll go ahead and fix that. I guess it's just reflex. So I'm just using dv as a nice placeholder, or I'm using v as a placeholder for um, the actual value of cosine x just to make this all easier when I'm doing all this factoring and stuff. 
So this is what this looks like when we multiply everything out. Then we have to do long division, which is really, really annoying. So this is just a lot of annoying brute work. We go ahead and do this long division, and we get the integral from 0 to 2 pi of negative cos 2 cosine x, which is just going to be 0 since this is, this is the integral over a full period. And then this minus 5 will also be integrated. Then we have this 11v plus 25. We go ahead and factor this, or sorry, split this up using partial fractions and the cover up method into these two separate terms. And then we go ahead and apply the wire stress substitution, which is u equals tangent of x over 2. And this will end up giving us an integral from negative infinity to infinity of something that ends up just being arctangent right here. So we just go ahead and simplify the denominator and then integrate using substitution, and we get negative 5 pi plus root 3 pi plus 2 root 2 pi. Problem number 3 was pretty fun since it required us to do a lot of factoring right here. So first of all, just looking at this, we have to sort of guess the first um, solution, and that's going to be x equals 1 just by looking at it. Then we go ahead and factor, and notice that we now we need to set this one equal to 0, and x equals 1 is yet again a solution. So now we can factor it as x minus 1 squared times x squared plus 2x plus 3, all inside the square root. Then we can take this x minus 1, of course, out of the square root, and we can complete the square on the inside of this uh, square root. We let u equals x plus 1, and we get this right here. We split this up into two separate integrals. This first integral is really easily done by letting u, uh, v equal u squared plus 2. And the second integral can be easily done by letting u equal square root 2 sine h of t, hyperbolic sine of t. And this gives us this answer right here, leading to this final answer. Also note that and in the b, they used a natural logarithm rather than hyperbolic sine, but they're equivalent answers again. This was another really fun problem. We have the integral from negative infinity to infinity of a bunch of terrible looking uh, terrible looking sines and cosines of 2 to the x and 3 to the x. And the solution here is really beautiful. First of all, we have to notice that um, this 4 cosine squared 3x minus 3 is actually really similar to this formula for cosine 3x, which is 4 cosine cubed of x minus 3 cosine x. And this over here, 4 cosine squared of 2x, actually happens when you divide sine squared of 2x over sine squared of x. So we can go ahead and rewrite this in this way. And notice that the denominators here now match up with this term right here, which means we can multiply this all in. And we can rewrite this 2 times 2 to the x and 3 times 3 to the x as 2 to the x plus 1 and 3 to the x plus 1. Now notice we have the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of x plus 1 minus f of x dx. Also, the limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x equals 0. What this means is that we can essentially turn this into the integral version of a telescoping series. So from here, we can write that um, the integral from negative infinity to a of f of x plus 1 minus f of x equals the integral from a to a plus 1 of f of x dx. Now, where did I, pull, where did I get this from? Well, if you sort of just visualize what's happening here, both f of x and f of x plus 1 are being integrated from negative infinity to a. And most of this integration is going to be cancelled all the way up to a, right? But f of x plus 1 goes a little bit further because um, it's shifted over by 1. It also has this additional integral from, neg from a to a plus 1. Um, that was a really terrible explanation, but it's the exact same thing as a telescoping series except with integrals instead of summations. <laughs> So this means that i is the limit as a goes to infinity of a of the integral from a to a plus 1 of sine squared of 2x cosine squared of 3x dx. In order to solve this integral, we can just expand these out using the trig identities. We get 1 half minus a cosine term, 1 half plus a cosine term. Now if you multiply all these terms out, you're going to end up getting something that looks a bit like 1 fourth minus 1 half cosine 3 to the x uh, plus 1 half cosine something else, right? And a bunch of cosine terms that come after here. But notice that all the cosine terms have hyper oscillation, which means that they're oscillating so fast that they can't actually accumulate any value. So all these other terms are unimportant when we're taking the integral. And the only thing that matters is this 1 fourth term, which is being integrated over a region of, of length 1. And so the overall answer is 1 fourth. Now on to problem number five.
we have a floor function, so we're just going to be converting it into a summation, as you can probably expect. This is the summation that we get, and performing this integration is a little bit annoying, but essentially we can just substitute u equals x cubed, and then um, do partial fractions, and I just skipped that because I figured it was pretty straightforward. We get ln x cubed minus 1 over x cubed plus 1 evaluated at n plus 1 and n. And after expanding this all out, we get some really, really nasty stuff over here. However, it's not the end of the world because we can sort of combine some of these terms into a telescoping series. So we're going to multiply this n on the inside and then we're going to add and subtract ln n plus 1 cubed minus 1 and ln n plus 1 cubed plus 1. So we end up getting these two telescoping series right here as well as this extra um, term over here that we're going to have to deal with separately. So for these telescoping series, we're just going to have these two uh, initial terms be subtracted out, and this, in, this initial term be subtracted out, and this initial term added, and that gives us 2 natural log 9 over 7. And then for the quote-unquote final terms, we take the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1. Uh, I don't know why it says over n plus 1. It should just be n plus 1 natural log of n plus 1 cubed minus 1 over n plus 1 cubed plus 1. This is just going to end up going to 0 because this dominates and goes to 0. And then we're going to be adding 1 6 times this other natural logarithm, which I've gone ahead and factored. Now when we go ahead and factor this, we get two more sets of telescoping series. This time ln 2 plus n minus natural log of n plus ln n squared plus n plus 1 minus ln n plus 1 squared plus n plus 1 plus 1. That was a mouthful. <laughs> um, anyway, again, we just do the same exact thing with here, right here. We subtract these first two terms and and add back and also add back the first term of this and we take the limit as n goes to infinity with this as well and that just goes to zero. So finally we are able to add together all our different terms and our final answer is 1 sixth natural log of 27 over 14. I have a video series which explains how to do telescoping series just like this one if you were a little bit confused on how that worked. So now onto the lightning round problems. These are pretty easy. This one was a little bit of fun because these two functions are actually inverse functions of one another. So if you sort of look at their graphs between 0 and 1, they're going to take on the exact same values, or not exactly, but they're going to cover the same area between 0 and 1 because, of course, all we did was reflect this area over the line y equals x. We didn't actually change the area, so the area given by these two integrals is exactly the same, so the answer must be 0. Lightning round number 2. After u equals x minus 1, we can integrate this directly. I won't bore you with the details of this. And lightning round problem 3, we just multiply these cosine x's into these tangents right here, and we end up getting uh, this right here, which you may notice as the sine angle addition formula. So we get sine 2025 x over cosine 2025 x. u equals cosine 2025 x, and our final answer is natural log cosine of 2025 x over 2025. I hope you guys enjoyed this really awesome video. Um, I know it's been getting a little bit long, but we had some really awesome problems this year with the MIT Integration B. Overall, I think uh, the competition this year could have been a lot better, but, you know, we can't expect everything to be perfect, and I hope to see you guys again next year for the next MIT Integration B. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Make sure to check out my videos on the semifinal and hopefully the quarterfinal, which I'll be making soon. Bye!